play against Aquinas. Aquinas is the only team that defeated our girls soccer team this year, although we did avenge the loss later. And the boys play Friday night against Honey Eye Falls, Lima. So, do we have any other board member comments at this time? If not, then let's go to the superintendent's report. And I have to tell you, they're really fantastic. I, I probably don't need to say that they're really fantastic kids. Um, so in our last two board meetings, uh, we shared with you some of the things that kids are doing academically. We talked about the, the one young man who scored the highest in terms of the math exam, 100%. And then we had a great student here in the last meet, at the last meeting who shared things that were happening at the high school. Um, and then just today, I was walking through the high school and some of our other schools, and I was able to uh, be a part of some of the classes. And one class in particular really impressed me. I was in the high school uh, looking at an art uh, classroom. And some of the work that some of our kids do, I tell you, it is just absolutely fantastic. And just to share with you, I, I have some uh, pictures tonight that I'd like to share with you all and just pass them around so you can see the quality and the, the, just the, the work that the kids are doing and the effort that's put in and, and really uh, making it a part of their learning experience. And it was just absolutely fantastic. So I just wanted to share that tonight and give that balance so you can see not only the, the top-notch work, work kids are doing academically, but also in terms of the extracurricular but, and also the, uh, the, the specials um, that they're participating in in terms of the visual arts. Just fantastic teachers, great kids, they're doing a really super job. So I wanted just, just to share that with you tonight. Second of all, I wanted to also tell you that uh, at our last meeting we talked about our web page. Uh, Amy shared that we were ready, we're getting ready to go live with the new page. Uh, we are ready to go live the 27th uh, of October, and on the page, again, you'll see the blue color, uh, but all of the things that you're used to seeing will be there. It'll just be a little more easier to navigate for, for everyone, including the community. And we're also talking about ways of putting extra communication items on that, too. Uh, one of the things that I'm very interested in is creating a Twitter account so that you can see and the community can see what's happening throughout the daytime uh, here at the district and we'll put some links on there and so it'll be a really neat page and a way to really continue to communicate with our community. So, so uh, I would have been able to really um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks comprehensively uh, sit down and talk with pretty much quite a bit of the entire nuclear plants are, uh, are struggling right now and you see quite a few starting to shut down and some Recent announcements of a Pilgrim Station in Massachusetts announcing a shutdown. Fitzpatrick in Oswego um, is expecting to make an announcement on their decision at the end of the month. So uh, over the last year or so, we, we decided, hey, we need to get out in the community a little bit more and talk about the benefits that GNA provides to the community, to the grid reliability um, and transmission system, and, uh, and just be a little more out there and open up our doors a little more. So we've had a lot more tours, a lot more community members coming in. Um, educating people on what we do. We've had some community nights, different things. Um, so this is just another one of those outreaches and anything you guys you know, can think of that we could help out with, you know, with the community, we'd be more willing to help out there. But going through the presentation, um, can we go back to that one slide? Do you have a picture? Uh, so if you see the transmission lines coming in across the sites, um, you look at Gene, you know, you don't even see our dome. We, when we built Gene in 1969, we put a facade around the dome so it wouldn't look like a, uh, it's more blended in with the community. Um, our trans you don't see transmission lines coming in, they're all underground buried. And I think we're the only nuclear plant in the country that buries the transmission lines coming in. Um, so that we more fit into the community. And I, have, I know people in this area who still don't even know it's a nuclear plant. They thought, one person commented, they thought it was an apple sauce factory. You know? <laughs> I think the apple orchard in your front helps that. But, uh, but uh, you know, so that's been our, you know, that's been our uh, vision from day one was to more fit into the community and, and not stand out and, uh, and it does look different. Anybody who comes to the site who's been to other nuclear plants always acknowledges that when they pull in. 29, extra 20 years and there's plants out there now looking to pursue another 20 on top of that. And uh, Gene would be fully capable of going to 2049, um, but right now with the economics it's not something we're out there pursuing right now um, for, for that additional 20 years. But it's something if things change we could. Um, we are recognized um, in the industry um, for our material condition of the plant. You know, I read in the paper once in a while, hey, it's an old plant. I invite anybody to come to that facility and walk around, and uh, nobody ever comes out saying, hey, it's an old facility. We do, you know, we have great workers at the site who uh, are dedicated to maintaining that plant in top condition, and uh, numerous people who come in will comment that, hey, it looks like a brand new plant. And uh, we do work hard to make sure that plant runs safe and reliable and, and is uh, clean. 
Um, there's an organization called IMPO. They evaluate every plant in the country. They come in every two years, and in their last visit, they recognized us as, a IMPO, as an IMPO strength in the area of material condition. So uh, we're proud of that, and we, and we plan to maintain that. Um, it's a Westinghouse two-loop pressurized water reactor. It's a relatively small nuclear plant. Um, for our community, when it was built, it was sized for this community, and it still is probably the right size for the local transmission system. And uh, when the New York ISO and the PSC look at it, you know, where it's situated, it is, is a, a prime location for maintaining transmission system reliability around here, and, it, uh, and it's the appropriate size for that. But, unfortunately, you know, in today's economics, a small, you know, nuclear power plant has certain costs. You know, the federal regulation requires a certain amount of security, different things, um, and that number of megawatts, when you divide it out, um, it adds to our cost per megawatt, which is our challenge right now. Um, you know, from a total cost of a nuclear site, we're the cheapest operating nuclear site in the country, um, and we're the lowest staffed. Um, we're staffed appropriately, but we are a very efficient organization. But just our number of megawatts being a single unit reactor um, is what really challenges right now. It's what's challenging the industry right now. Successful at doing that. Um, so, but we got a lot of work to do still in this outage. Um, we do pay about 10 million in state and local property taxes. Um, and if you look at our 580 prices down to, to levels where they're not even really drilling for it right now. But while those prices are low, it's driven electric prices significantly low. And that's the challenge in the industry right now. You see a lot of coal plants shutting down um, and nuclear plants. Um, but but it, obviously the concern there is if you have too much reliance on one fuel source, then uh, you know, if those prices go up, then everybody's prices go up. There's no balance. So that's, uh, that's one of the problems. And, uh, Clean, you know, we do we do save about two million tons of uh, carbon dioxide annually, being a clean energy source. Um, you know, I know when I read in the paper, people say, "Hey, you could replace this with a windmill or a hydro dam." Or, I'm sorry, a windmill or uh, solar panels. And we did some studies, and it took a I forgot the exact numbers. I think it was five thousand acres of solar panels, or uh, about two hundred fifty-six thousand acres of windmills to uh, replace Gene. So. It, it wouldn't be an easy feat. No one's going to go out and throw a bunch of solar panels up too quick and uh, replace Canadian for clean energy, which is a challenge in New York right now. New York has very aggressive goals for uh, clean energy, and, uh, and really all the multi-millions of dollars we've invested in the state in clean energy, you know, solar and wind, really is almost equivalent from day one to what Canadian makes. So you shut a nuclear plant down, if Fitzpatrick goes down, it would eliminate all the clean energy goals that... Uh, you know, that we've set in this state. So, so nuclear does have a key role in uh, clean energy. Do you get any green money from the states? No, that's one of the, uh, that's one of the challenges. And, you know, they fight it out in Illinois right now. There's a lot of discussions on that. Is, uh, if you look at the amount of subsidies that goes into solar and wind, um, you know, to buy, to, per megawatt, there's no comparison. <coughs> upgrades to uh, attempt to mitigate, upgrade the transmission system to support again a shutdown. Um, but there's a study going on right now combined while they're doing those upgrades to see is this really going to resolve all the issues. Um, since since they started planning those upgrades, you know, there's been a couple other plants that have announced to shut down. Um, Huntley Station, Dunkirk are looking at shutting down too. Um, so, you know, I think the PSC recognizes if everybody can't shut down, someone needs to provide power around here um, versus just buying it from Pennsylvania or Canada. Um, so, so there's another study going on to say even after they finish those upgrades, will that be enough? or do we need to continue to operate GNA after that period to work? Obviously a lot of interest in employees at the site in uh, what that study is going to say and where we're going to end up for our long-term operation because of that. But right now, the, the RSSA will support our operation um, through this period. <coughs> Reliable, and, uh, and we don't, you know, we try to, try to be a good neighbor in the community, um, and, and I think those survey results reflect that. We do have a fairly positive um, favorability rating with people who live near the plant. Um, we do have, in the last slide there, we do have a community night every year. We open up our site. We have, a, uh, we have different departments come out and display what they do. We open up our simulator. We send it out, invites to everybody who lives within 10 miles of the plant. Um, and anybody can come out and go through that. And our uh, doctor was out there this year. Mm -hmm. and we uh, had a pretty good turnout. And uh, everybody, I'd say, who comes in, you know, some people come in expressing concerns about nuclear Almost everybody who leaves seems to leave with a positive impression of the site, and, uh, and we, so we intend to keep doing that, having those community nights, and, uh, and of course, sponsoring any tours. If anybody wants to come in, we'll support tours, we'll bringing people in, be more open on what we do. We also, uh, you know, I have a meet with the uh, local political leaders, 
um, about every quarter in, little, or in that frequency. And then anybody who lives near the plant, we have a dinner with our, our closest neighbors to the station two, three times a year where I just go through and talk to them about things we're doing at this site, things they'll see. We had a refueling outage right now. We met with them two weeks ago to describe what we're doing to uh, minimize. I just have a question. I'm, this is not in my realm at all. Yeah. But, you know, I heat my house with gas. Yep. So I should see less in my gas. But with all the electronics and all the things that we plug in and every... You go to an airport, you can't find a, a plug that isn't full of somebody's charging unit. So where is the demand? Why isn't there... I mean, you don't get electric from gas, so I don't understand. If yeah. you just... You know where yeah. I'm going. Well, you do... Right? There is natural gas plants around, so if you uh, you generate electricity, there's a lot of them. Um, not many in this area, you know, you've, in other... Uh, in Pennsylvania and different states, there's a lot of them, and people build it, some in Buffalo. Um, those facilities... So if you look at a... A nuclear power station, you'll have 700 employees in that area. Um, you know, they all work in the communities. Our cost to operate that plant is mostly employees. And, and those employees live in the community, spend their money in the community. Um, just a small portion of that is our fuel. And it's just the way, because of all the regulations and everything that goes with nuclear power, it's a very labor intensive thing. Um, at a gas station, if they shut the A down and we put a gas station in, um, you might have 40 employees. And the majority of the cost to operate that station would be natural gas. So our, their price will fluctuate significantly with the price of natural gas. So there is natural gas plants out there. Right now prices are so low, in general, they're not even building them um, because demand's down with the recession. Demand came down. Energy conservation, you know, they, you know there just isn't, you know, I think it's not like the amount of lo loads going down, but there is efficiencies. It's not increasing right now with natural gas prices being low. Is it safe? Is it this? You know, because you got to think. They heard all they heard was nuclear, and you got to think in 1965 or 66 yeah. when they started this. You know, World War II was only a few years back, and that's kind of how people thought it was just going to blow up. But it's really been, as far as being having well-trained people here in our area. You know, it brought a lot here. It's been a very good provider to the district, the county. The area we've never had an issue with, uh, you know, or any kind of safety thing. The drills go off. The kids know. I mean, it's just worked so well and been such a, a good neighbor, like you indicated. That I'm hoping that something turns around because it really gives this area a very needed economic boost and, of course, to the district. It's been a very good test. Yep. Uh, we, we, we obviously hope that too. I know, you know, you know. Some, you know, and and I, I know many of your employees, and they're yep. just like, yep. cross your fingers kind of thing, yep. you know, and nobody knows. Yep. We got a lot of employees. You know, there's jobs out there, but most employees that work at that site want to live here, you know, and don't want to leave. But, uh, but we'll have to see, you know, and part of us coming out here is, uh, you know, there will be decisions that have to be made in the future. There will be political, you know, influence we need to, might need help with, and we might be coming to ask some of you to uh, support us or write letters in support. Um, so, uh, you know, any, any support you guys could provide in the future on that, we'd, we'd appreciate it. We do like being a good neighbor here. We do, you know, we recognize, you know, when we did the tax negotiations, you know, that's one of my concerns if a plant goes away. There is a big impact to community. So I've been trying to be honest with all the local town supervisors and stuff that it's, you know, we're not making it up. It's a real threat out there. Um, and we want to make sure that people can plan for it and look ahead and do everything we can to keep the plan here. But uh, you got to plan for everything. So. so we might be reaching out for some help, you know, for letters and stuff in the future. <coughs> but support us, we'd appreciate it. I got one for the lighter side. Yep. We used to fish down there. It was great fishing. <laughs> 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 I can't do that anymore. I want to get a jet ski through behind the rocks. Yeah, we somehow <laughs> work through it and we get done. <laughs> Concerns at our, 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 our PAC Center. We had uh, some issues uh, during our superintendent's uh, conference day. The day, first day there, it was pretty warm in the center. 
We had some issues there that we have been looking into, and then we also had about a week or so ago uh, a water leak issue that was bubbling up over uh, near uh, uh, the primary school. So we'll have uh, Greg and, and Bob talk a little bit about that, and then uh, we will also move from there into a discussion around the signage, um, just so that you can get some feedback on the recent bids that came in and uh, issues around that. So. Greg and Bob. Well, um, with the pack, very sorry that happened. We, I had the mechanic out the day before. I said, if you do anything this year, make sure that air conditioning is working for the first day of school. Oh, boy, he did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> he, he came the day before and checked it. It was run. Everything was fine. I come in the next day, and what had happened, this had happened before, too. Um, there's the main lugs that actually, you know, host the power to this compressor had burned off one other time. Um, this mechanic had worked on it before. He came, he, he uh, replaced the lugs, you know, hooked it, everything back up. We were back up and running. Well, this time when the lugs burned out, um, I was kind of smelling something and ended up being the in the compressor. So this compressor, um, well, it'll be the second one that was replaced. This is an original one, though, from 98. Um, we're figuring, I got a ballpark figure of about $30,000 once said and done. I mean, you need to hire a crane, um, you need to remove the old one, bring the old one up, and there's, there's quite a bit of work of, of piping that thing in. Um, you know, getting 18 years out of a compressor is not bad. Or, or the gas line coming in, um, she was able to pinpoint it, but um, what had happened there, it looked like the road used to come down past the, where the gym were before the, the gym was on there. The road used to come all the way past there and run along the property line. Well, there used to be some fire hydrants there. And it looks like one of, the, one of them, when those fire hydrants were removed and things were done, done a little shoddy. So, yeah, it developed a, a leak there. But um, we were able to fix it. We had to fix it on a Saturday because we had to shut the water off for about four hours or so. So we really couldn't do it during, during the school day, um, which, you know, we incurred just a little bit of overtime expense there, but um, that one, that is, was ending up being about 6000 just for the fix. Um, I'm looking, I'm looking at about 2000 maybe 2500 for the, for the paving. So, uh, two unexpected, expensive things happening in, in really a very short time is pretty, pretty unusual, but I mean, it is what it is. So, boy, I'm not sure if there's any questions there. It's kind of one of those things that why we try to make sure you put a little extra in your budget because you never know when you might have the Performing Arts Center and lugs go, basically. Uh, but, uh, we have lugs. Yeah, yes, yes. So we thought uh, originally it was like, you know, thunder that hit it, but it looks like more like, no, these things, they just kind of, they've gone. Yeah, right. they just, get old and they wear off. After 18 years, it's... It may be time for a new set of So your successors, you're going to leave this information for you to know when to plan for a new I mean, if it was like a couple thousand dollar difference between a full color or a single color, I could see it. But, I mean, we're talking from twelve to $35,000 on a full color board of both schools. And only being a couple thousand feet away, I'm just wondering if we're really looking out for our money closely. And also with the other expenses right now, I'm just wondering if maybe we should hold off a little bit on this. And I would really like to see the see a board. Okay, actually, is there anyone around here that we can go look at, like what we've got here? Webster, Palmac, Williamson, all have um, uh, board Dectronics boards. Uh, so I don't I don't know if they're the, the I don't know if they're, 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 they're not this, this, this model. This is the latest and, and greatest. But the direction from the board at the time last year when Mr. Calabati was here was let's do it once, let's do it right. right. So yeah. right. when the new modifications were coming out, we purposely held off to see what those would be because we didn't want to go ahead and put something in and then a month later have it and be I agree yeah. completely. not safe of the art. I mean, I understand the question, Dennis, you know, do we really need that? Do we um, need two colored boards? That's all, I, I, you know, yep. I mean, if they were 10 miles away from each other, okay, yeah, I could see that. But a couple thousand feet away? And most of the big events are held here. Mm -hmm. So do we really need that at the middle school? That's all I'm saying. And personally, I think our money could be spent better other places, like the $30,000 that it costs us to repair the roof. Um, 
I just I don't see spending that kind of money as personally. I mean, I don't know how everybody well, else feels. I, I think uh, I, I think we have to go on to an action item and then have that discussion. Okay. Well, it says discussion. Yeah. Well, I touching on you are going to have two different messages going on because it's a different school and. It, if I was in charge of the middle school, I would hate to say, why did they get the good one? You know, it's information, it was a priority, and you know, a lot of people have been looking at doing that for a few years. I mean, we did do have money in for emergencies, which is some of these repairs were, so, I mean. You know what I mean? I would add, if, if okay, board is just, whatever you get, right? If you, if you do choose to, to move forward with the signs. So you want to get uh, things for the future, not just for today. Things are going to last longer. You want to think about the next couple of years. That's State what it is, and then. That's why I asked the question, Greg. And then or that's equal. That, that's suspected. That's how it came okay. from. Right. Greg, assuming we have no more air conditioning malfunctions, assuming we have no more water leaks, what's your best guess as to what we have set aside in the budget for surplus? Ron, that's a great question. Um, you know, as you know, over the past few years, um, I hear a qualifier coming. <laughs> uh, you know, we've we've made some changes to our budgeting practice um, for a lot of different reasons. We're a lot tighter than we and used we're to a lot be. tighter than you know. Um, so in 2012-13, um, you see, I built in a little over a million dollars, a million sixty-two thousand dollars in the budget. In places that I knew that if Bob spent all his money, Michelle, Joe, anybody, that money was going to be sitting there. And we were appropriating at the time about a million dollars back, so the money left over was used the next year as a revenue. Uh, 13, 14, it was the same amount of money. Then after the OSC audit um, and, and some things that showed up in the report, um, for the 14, 15 budget, we built in 770, so I took almost 300,000 out. Um, in this current year's budget, there's about 453000 That's if everybody spends every dollar that's allocated to them. Typically, they do not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we run into repairs all the time. These, these are clearly larger than anticipated, but, um, you know, that if we don't end up with that million dollars at the end of the year, then that's going to be a hole <coughs> moving forward for next year because you have to find that revenue unless we remove that much expense from our program. Now, there's a lot of ways to do that. I mean, there's been times before during uh, Mr. Haven's time when we froze spending, like in March or April, and we really started managing, you know, we, we might not have gone on as many conferences. You know, we started managing to make sure that we would end up where we need to be. Um, you know, that, that's always an option. I mean, clearly part of our financial planning and looking at it. Um, so. You know, we need to have about a million dollars left at the end of the year, um, especially with a tax cap that looks like it's going to be at zero. So our ability to go out and raise taxes by the formula is going to be almost nil. Um, so you're going to be relying on state aid to uh, absorb increases in state to absorb any increases in operating costs. So we really can't afford to have any loss of revenue. So, but you know, the fund balance piece, it's, it's a year long, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. You know, there's clearly a way to manage that to make sure we end up where we need to be. Um, you know, we still have some flexibility in the budget, but things are clearly tighter than they've been in the past. I know that I would feel a lot more comfortable making this decision closer to the end of the fiscal year than right now, or either, or, or put it out of the, uh, the boat for taking it out of the uh, capital fund. For the science? Yes. You know, one of the two things, but, mm -hmm. you know, right here we've got a lot of space in between the end of the year. You know, so we have the end of the year picture pretty well defined, you know, that we can, I would feel better about making this decision. How long is the bid good for? Um, typically, I think the prices are good for uh, 90 days according to the, to the bid specs. Um, we could have that conversation with the vendor, see if they're willing to, um, you know, hold their price. Uh, and... It could be something that's put on the ballot as a uh, as an option to the to the public to mm -hmm. to do it as, as Matt described. You know, I have to do both at the same time. Well, the bid was made that way. If you were to change the parameter, then you would oh, rebid. Yeah. Right. I mean, the vendor Which might say they can't guarantee the price. You know, then. 
um, so they might not be willing to hold that price. Yep. That doesn't mean that we couldn't rebid it at that time right. or go through the vote process. If the vote is, is positive, then go out and bid it after that. Um, you know, that that's, a, that's also an option for the board to consider. The yeah. other thing, too, with technology is, as we all know, it just keeps going down as far as cost. That's at all. And, 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 and the argument that says prices are going to keep coming down because technology keeps getting better, if that was the case, not one of us in this room would have <laughs> an a, iPhone, an HDTV in our house. Right. So, yes, that's a valid argument. That is not a. Oh, all I'm saying is I think that the price would be able to hold because the technology, the prices stay pretty right. level. What about, what about if, if, is there a time where like installing this would be more expensive if we did it in the middle of December than making the decision in the next 20 minutes? Well, the timing of this now, uh, we were still very hopeful that we would be able to get it in um, in late November while the weather still really made it feasible. I mean, they have put in, you know, done installations in December and January, but, you know, I think like anything else, it, it could affect the, the quality of the end product when you're asking people to stand out there in the freezing cold and the snow. Um, you know, we built the auditorium like that, and, um, you know, we had the through-all flashing problem. Well, that was done. It was behind schedule, and that roof should have been on there long before it was. They had to build temporary enclosure, which made it a lot harder to oversee what the contractors did. And that's since the through all flashing failed, and it was a $500,000 repair in a future capital project. So I think you run into those risks, Phil, if you do that. We, we currently are not using this sign because it's, it's labor intensive. It, it's, it's difficult to get messages on there. Um, a sign such as we're proposing buying, I think, would be an ideal tool for us to publishers who, uh, the kids who have taken uh, two or three AP exams and have gotten threes, fours, or fives. I mean, to have the electronic signboard to me is a is a is a way to promote uh, academic achievement across the district. The, the issue is, do we want to spend the money at this time? Our broad goals were acknowledging academic achievement and. Uh, communicating with the community, trying to bring them in. And, just and you know what, there's always going to be something that comes up. There's always going to be, we could spend it here, we could do it here, we could do that. There's always going to be something. Sometimes you just got to... We had to hire a six to one teacher. Over the last five years, what's the biggest one that you can think of? You know, as far as a, like a repair type thing, Ron, I think something like this because the other compressor that we had we replaced and that was about $25,000 but that was five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. Short of maybe having a student move in with tremendous needs, I mean this goes back more than five years but when I first started we had a student when Ed Kirkhoven was still here and that student had to be sent to I think Massachusetts at over $100,000 and that was not a budgeted item so you know there's things like that do come up and you know, that's why the budget, I always say it's a living, breathing, working document. I mean, it's, it's there to serve your needs, and you have to, you know, kind of manipulate it from time to time to, to be where you want to be as far as our goals and our mission. Is there, I'll just bring this, I'm just bringing this up as a talking point. Is there something to Dennis's uh, point about this is where a majority of the large fields are, this is where the pack is? Is there any... What are people's thoughts on one board versus pitting the high school against the middle school and they get it, I don't, and are we opening a can of worms? Is there any? I don't think so. I there, are, there are three grades there. We do are do four stages. grades. We are, this is, this is the high school. This is a culmination of a lot of events. This is even where music in our schools takes place. This is, you know, I mean, we don't what build goes on here compared to what goes on in the middle school. Not that they're any less or not that their people aren't any more valued. It's where we have all the events here. Exactly. So why do we need a... I, I just... That's what I, I'm, I'm asking. A, I'm kind of against the full color board down there. We issue. don't build a varsity field, field, field for them. It's, it's just two boards for the secondary okay. buildings. You know, we're not building them a varsity field or a huge JV field. I mean, there's the varsity field and there's the JV. It, it, it changes once you get to high school. That's all I'm, well, you know, I'm looking at and just, that way. Just, uh, if we're talking about possibly <laughs> looking at just one board, that's, that's different than what we asked for. So 
we would have to the vendor, we would have to go back to them and say because sometimes there's a quantity piece to their pricing. I mean, if we went from two to one, you know, in fairness, that's kind of changing the playing field. So I think in all, uh, as far as proper business etiquette, we'd have to go back and see if they'd be willing to honor half that price for one board. I mean, I, I, you can't. Bob and I cannot sit here and guarantee that because it's really different than what we what we bid. I have a question. <coughs> Middle school is a light board, right? Does it work? Yeah, it's a yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay, so if instead of me driving down three fifty and seeing two signs, why don't I drive down three fifty and take a right and put one down there? Down at the Ontario Primary and Elementary School. <laughs> is that <laughs> a lot of a good idea? <laughs> Palmer Hall. You're at the fire department. If we could, if it would be one of those, wasn't that one of our things we started talking about? Sharing services. services. They have a sign board there that the fire department has. I don't know how new that is, but it's oh, they use it. Yep. Oh, so they maybe would that would be something we could one step future. towards sharing service and saving yeah, us a little bit of money. Yeah, I don't know. Just a thought. Yeah, that's a good idea. Too, so. I like so when you think about a shared too. service, right? A shared service is a little different. <laughs> that that's usually. Uh, a staff member, a service to the community, right. a particular, it's not usually a sign. I just want to be upfront with you about that one, right? That, I know we can see it that way, but typically a shared service is, so we're doing uh, a gas share, or, and I right. did shared services in my last district, or it's a staff person who's coming in to work with the district and also working for uh, the county. But it, that typically wouldn't qualify, um, just want to... Shared cost. Right, right. It could be a shared right. cost. Right. right. That's what or a shared I'm, opportunity, yes. but not really a shared service. So, board, <laughs> it's, it's really up to you if you it, want to take time. care. I think we're being told it's time to move and go on. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. Um, so under board business, can I get a motion to approve the signed bid? Tim, do we have a second? Does that mean? We're going to vote on it. Oh, okay, no. As it stands. As it stands. Okay. No, okay. Pam, second. Any other discussion? So at this point, we would be voting to buy two signs as as bid. One for the high school. One. For so I would say let's look at if we can do a shared cost, shared service. Great. But I am very interested in not having two signs this close and maybe looking at the cost. I don't care if we put it on our own property. I would like to know what is what is the cost of having a sign here and a sign over there in front of our other two buildings hitting a whole different part of the community that's driving by. This together and on page five gives you an idea of the people uh, that we met with and we interviewed. Uh, the risk assessment is basically where we try and understand and evaluate what the district's procedures and internal controls are. Um, and determine whether there might be any deficiencies or weaknesses that can be improved or strengthened. Uh, we're not really doing any testing in the risk assessment, so we don't really determine whether controls are operating effectively, just whether they're designed effectively at that point. And, uh, and that's where uh, we get an understanding of all of this and we kind of categorize high, medium, or low risk. It's somewhat uh, subjective, um, but it kind of lays out a, a snapshot of the district and uh, potential areas to be aware of or potential uh, areas to select to focus um, the, the detailed audit work and the testing, um, you know, what area the, the, the district or the audit committee might want to select uh, to kind of drill down deeper. So on page six, it kind of gives you a snapshot of where we ended up uh, this past year. These are the different areas that we look at, and we've got um, the risk from the 2014 school year versus the 2015 school year. Um, you can see that in, in most areas, uh, you know, everything's in pretty good shape. The only changes really were a couple areas went from moderate to low, so that's all very positive. I think um, what I'll tell you is what I told the audit committee. Um, you know, now the risk assessment, there's not a lot of new stuff that comes out of the risk assessment every year. Um, I think when this was first put in place, there were a lot of things that, that we as auditors could recommend and uh, changes that could be made to strengthen procedures. Uh, that was a moderate 
um, in the prior year was because IT was was the area that was selected as the focus area um, a couple, three years ago or so, four years ago. And there were a number of findings that came out of that report. And it took a while for some of those findings to be addressed and to clear. Okay. And so I think it kind of stayed at a moderate for a couple of years. And this uh, past year went down to, to, uh, to low. Um, there was also, I think in prior years, there had been some turnover in, in that area, a new, new IT director, um, some changes in some of the IT systems and controls. And you can see in the matrix at the end, those are both factors in us in terms of how we calculate and determine overall risk. So okay. um, if you were to look at a prior year risk assessment report and compare it to this year's, you'll see that those two areas had uh, had values in them other than zero, um, which is what they are this year. Okay. There was a couple of years ago, Phil, when the area of focus was IT, and so out of that came a corrective action plan, and part of that plan was being addressed by the capital project, uh, right. security of the uh, of, of our network closets, um, went to badge access rather than uh, key. There was also some fire suppression issues um, that were addressed. So. Um, over the, the life of the project, you know, some of the things we did internally, um, just with our staff and changing our procedure, but then some were actual physical improvements to the site that then, once the project was done, it allowed it to shift down to a lower okay. lower risk level. Your firm does a number of, of, of uh, internal audits for schools. Correct. We work with about 25 school districts right now, give or take a few. How would you characterize this report compared to the other 25? Could better, worse? Uh, this report is probably pretty similar to what we've, what we've started to do over the last year or so is build in some what I call light testing to, because there's, there's just not a lot of coming, coming out of the, the standard uh, review of documentation and the standard interviews that, that normally um, are part of this process. So what we're trying to do is go a little, you know, one step further and do some light testing to see um, if the controls that we understand them to be, whether they are actually operating. So we'll look at bank recs. Are they current? Are they being, you know, reviewed and signed off? We'll look at, um, you know, the payroll registers. Are they being certified and payroll change reports? Is there evidence that management is looking at those? And um, you know, is that consistent with what they would expect due to new hires or termination? So we're starting to do a little bit of light testing just because there's not as much that comes out of our evaluation from the interviews and the review of documentation. So much so that the state has actually backed off of the requirements from when they first created this. So districts like Sodus, Lyons, Williamson, uh, being smaller than us, are no longer required to have the internal audit function. I think it's based on enrollment, 1,500, yeah. Right. Like, so 1,500 and under, they no longer have to go through this process. 1,500 and over, you're still required to continue on. Which ironically is kind of probably got it a little bit reversed. Right. <laughs> because it's the 1,500 less students. They're likely to have duplication and control. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But they're also the ones that are hit harder by, financially, by these, you know, having to pay for these things. And so Albany eventually did kind of concede and they, let those districts off the hook. Um, okay, uh, the next report is the area that was selected last year by the uh, district and the audit committee food service. Uh, and again, I'm going to walk you through this fairly quickly, but let me know if you have any questions. I know this is an area of interest, at least, if not concern, in uh, a lot of our school districts. Uh, it's been an area that uh, has had some challenges over the last several years for a number of, of reasons. Um, so we'll just kind of walk you through the different elements that we look at when we dig in and do a detailed review of, of this area. Um, so page two has just got some you know real basic background and objective information. Page three starts uh, to get into the different things that we look at. So federal and state aid submissions for the free and reduced lunch program. Um, those have to those are tracked by your point of sale system in terms of the volume of meals that are being served that um, fall into that category. These have to be reported monthly um, in order for the district to uh, get its aid and, and reimbursement. 
And so we look at that um, for the whole for the course of a year. Um, are those numbers that are submitted accurate compared with the point of sale system? Are they being submitted timely? Um, I think overall, we didn't have any significant concerns here. The one item here just discusses, uh, you know, uh, maybe trying to make sure that that it's that they're all submitted timely, just from a cash uh, cash flow perspective. Uh, there was some delay in a few months, but in terms of you know, it, nothing went real significant delays and there were no inaccuracies in what's being reported so you're getting all of your aid um, there's a minor issue with you know maybe you can improve cash flow slightly um, so no problems really in work and we get the tax returns now okay uh -huh. and um, which I think is good because otherwise we were just taking things at face value and sometimes they weren't they didn't all add up mm -hmm. you know a lot of people qualified originally and now when they show they have to bring their tax return all of a sudden they don't yeah, well, that's that's definitely true. I mean, a lot of times what will happen is when the district makes its selection of applications that it's going to test and it sends out the letter to the families requesting information, they don't get a response because presumably many of the families can't substantiate that level of income. Um, you know, they so. The, in those cases, those those kids, those families have to be dropped from the program. So, and that's what that's what happens. Overall, I mean, we didn't have we, we, we look at quite a few of these, and we didn't come across any significant issues. One of them, it looked like uh, there had been a change made at some point during the year, and there was no evidence or documentation of why that change had been made that was in the file. So that's the item that we discuss here. But um, there was, you know, a, a reasonable explanation for why our testing differed from from what the the qualification had been granted. So um, overall, no significant issues in that area. Uh, the next page is where we get into the cash handling uh, review and internal uh, a review of procedures and internal controls for the daily handling of cash. The registers counting each register. How does that money? get to the bank, is that uh, deposit consistent with your point of sale system, um, is it uh, showing up in your bank statements accurately, uh, are bank statements being reconciled over and short amounts, are those reasonable, no excessive or uh, no excessive amounts or patterns of amounts. Um, and so again, we didn't have any uh, items, significant areas of concern. You do have some vending machines that are being operated. The only item that we discuss here is to try and um, make sure. You can see that there's still work to be done. Um, you know, this past year, $47,000 deficit. So it's not a time when they can kind of relax on all this. I don't know if there's going to be any legislative relief from this or not in Albany. I know there's a lot of people squawking about it. Uh, you know the. Lawmakers are getting an earful from a lot of staffing and, and everything, and you have have you know much. I mean, every district is seeing this though, because kids don't want to eat kale chips. You know, they don't want whole wheat pizza. They don't want to be told they can't have this and that. They want to eat what they want to eat, and we have hungry kids. Yeah. 